This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. rejoice. You're right, that's the word. Rejoice and be glad in it. We're here to give honor and to praise God. And I rejoice because of the privilege of being able to be pastor here at Wyandotte First United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Mark Miller, and I welcome you who are here in person and all of you who are also watching online in our uh, live presentation this morning. And yes, we're here to honor God and to praise God, and we want to start out by singing that way, too. Uh, to God Be the Glory is a song that we all have sung before, we know very well, and we're going to sing that with the organ this morning. I invite you to stand if you're able, and so we can sing uh, that very well and very beloved hymn that we know. To God be the glory. declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Uh, all glory to God. Let's sing verse number two. but there's a new book that's called Everything is Figure Outable. Is that a book you'd like to read? I think I do. Everything is Figure Outable. And we remember that when Paul writes to the church in Philippi, Paul wrote, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of the glory in Christ Jesus. To God and Father be glory forever and ever. And so through God, we're gathered here remembering that we may be confused sometimes, but everything is figure outable. God leads us in the way that God wants us to go, and we offer God all the glory and honor. Let's sing verse 3.
For it is God who said, Let the light shine out of darkness. And God made his light to shine in our hearts and to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed on the face of Christ. And we are the ones who represent Jesus Christ. So let's sing that chorus again. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh up to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may God be glorified in our worship this morning, and may God be uh, revered in all that we do in our worship. I'll invite you to sit back down again. And you know, why not First United Methodist Church is, a, a, I would call it a diverse church, and when I say diverse, that's because we love everybody, we invite everybody to be a part of, of who we are, and we, are, we commit ourselves to loving everyone. And so we hope that you will come. Some people have been coming back, and uh, again, I welcome you, those of you who are in person, and I hope more of you will come back again. We've got, we've got plenty of room, and uh, we are getting safer and safer, uh, many of you have had both of your vaccines. I have uh, for quite some time. And so we're getting closer and closer to when we can open up some more even and be a part of each other and to minister in person, which is something different for us. You know, Why Not First United Methodist Church is a Christ-centered, people-oriented ministry. And I say people-oriented because we really care about outreach and mission. Uh, in Christ, because we're Christ-centered, we focus on, on people. And so that's why I share every Sunday opportunities that you have to serve God, opportunities that you have for growth in your relationship with God, and whatever opportunities there are for, for us to be a church going outside of these walls. And so in sharing opportunities, I want, you, want to remind you that our June Mission of the Month is a program called, an outreach program called Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia. And that actually has spread beyond Liberia. Uh, Sierra Leone is a country just north of Liberia. And uh, this program, Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia, has uh, spread actually to Sierra Leone. And there's a video for you to watch to, to see some of the things specifically that are happening with Healthy Women, Healthy Liberia. The Nemwa Child Survival Project, working in collaboration with the Gansa United Methodist Hospital, is changing lives and changing futures by building wells. Nenwa has reduced child mortality by 60% through community-based primary health programs by promoting leading factors of abundant health like exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life and improved access to clean water. So our mission and outreach, our, our ministry, actually extends way beyond our locality all the way to Africa and to Liberia and to Sierra Leone, as you just discovered. But what about here? What about our mission to our community? Well, right now we're actively uh, in mission concerning blessings and a, in a brown bag, and that's something that's done through the Wyandotte Ministerial Association. And there are different churches who are taking part, and, and we're filling these brown bags, these blessings for families who are in need in our community. And for us, for our church, our responsibility is to provide 
900 boxes of either rice a or macaroni and cheese. That's a lot of boxes, and we've, we have over seven, or around 700 right now. I don't know how many may have come in this morning, but we're really close to reaching our goal of being able to, to provide 900 boxes of rice a and mac and cheese as a part of the brown bag blessings. And there are a couple times during the summer when uh, we as the church, and we'll let you know, are responsible for filling those bags and for actually taking them to locations where uh, those bags will be picked up. So I'm glad that we can be a part of that locally. Are you? And thank you for supporting that. Thank you for the many boxes that have come in already. Now the, the trustees have decided that we're going to have a landscape work day at the Parsonage and uh, we're getting some, some mulch to come in that we'll be able to put around. And uh, to tell you the truth, that landscape has pretty much grown out and overgrown. And I've been very limited to what I can do, as you know, because I can't move my left arm very well. And so we're having a work day, and it's starting at 10 a.m. That's next Saturday, uh, June 19th, or this coming Saturday, however you want to say that. Uh, the very next Saturday that happens. And so for lunch, I'll buy some hot dogs. We can grill up some hot dogs. And uh, so we'll provide lunch for you. And so if you're able to help, come at uh, 10 a.m. or whenever you're able to that day. I'd like to say the pool's open for you to swim in. It's not open yet. And it might happen this week. I've been calling the people that open our pool and I've, I've yet to hear from them. So maybe it will happen this week and if so, we'll have the pool open. And if you're hot after working uh, that landscaping at the parsonage, then you'll have an opportunity to swim at that point. Now also there are a couple of community events that are happening, opportunities for you to take, play, take place and what's happening in Wyandotte. One is the 4th of Fourth of July parade, which goes right by our church. Did I point the right way? I get twisted around when I'm inside. Is it this way? <laughs> um, I know where I'm at. <laughs> I just get mixed up on what the directions are when I get inside. So we've got the Fourth of July parade, and since that comes right by the church, and we invite you to come and uh, sit on our church lawn to enjoy that and uh, we'll have some hot dogs and some family fun on that day as well. And actually also the Wyandotte Street Art Fair is happening again. That's back on, maybe you, some of you didn't even know that. But as a church, we will be having a, a pie shop and so we'll need pies and we'll have a used book sale. Bring your used books in by June 27th I think is the date. And uh, also, there will be artisans that will be here in our church. And also, the mission market will be open. And so, we have some sign up sheets, I know, in the back outside the sanctuary, if we're able to help with any of that. And we appreciate uh, your participation in being the community as these things are happening right in our midst. Something else, uh, you, most of you are familiar that our uh, office manager, Vicki Dorland, is retiring the end of June. I'm really going to miss her, and I know a lot of you are as well. I, a lot of you have gotten, have developed some really good phone relationships with Vicki, especially during this time of uh, global pandemic, and our office hasn't been open during part of that time. So we're going to Miss Vicki and we're having the last Sunday of this month, June 27th, we're going to have a, a retirement celebration for her. And that's going to be like a cake and ice cream affair. So hope that you will stay for that and uh, wish Vicki well. And we're also asking you to uh, bless her with a love gift and send that love gift to the church 
to um, attention Melissa Goodwin because she is the staff parish relations committee chairperson or send it to her home and we'll collect those gifts and uh, present them to uh, Vicki. So a lot going on and those things that I've mentioned uh, that uh, for mission, especially if you're giving beyond your tithe, uh, send those to the church, but also concerning your tithe. We need your regular giving as well. And please send those to the church, Wyandotte First United Methodist Church, 72 Oak Street, Wyandotte, Michigan, 48192. And thank you for participating in so many ways in being the church. Uh, let's bow our heads and bow our hearts for a word of prayer. And what I want you to realize as we're praying is that we're at the time in the Christian year which we call ordinary time, and green is the color for ordinary time, and that, because green means growth. And so we're in ordinary time in which we're thinking about our growing in the Lord and uh, how we might do that. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, in the season of growth, open our hearts to grow in your love. Help us to truly trust in your creative process in our lives. We look around and we see the beauty of your world, the blossoming flowers, the plants, the growth of our children, uh, the joy of celebrations like graduation and marriage. A and we receive new life in all of that. We give you thanks. We also, though, see the sadness and the sorrow that has invaded our world when systems of injustice and hatred lay claim to people's lives. So help us to place our trust in you so that when we are serving others that they may come to know of your abiding love and power. They may know your freedom and the justice which comes from you and which we promote because we love our neighbor. Give us courage and give us great joy as we serve you. We know the nursery rhyme, Lord, Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How does your garden grow? Well, that's a good question. It grows with lots of work. It grows by preparing the soil and selecting the seeds and planting them just the right distance apart. And we watch for weeds, making sure that uh, they are fed with the right plant food, that soil. And so how does my garden grow, oh God? Well, it grows with lots and lots of hard work. And we thank you, uh, dear God, that through your son Jesus, Jesus shares the parable of the mustard seed. And it is so small, how can it possibly grow? Only through faith in God and diligence in our part to water, to fertilize, to provide sunlight, and to trust in you, oh God. And what could possibly come from such a tiny seed? Well, you tell us in the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is like the grain of a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed the field, which indeed is smaller than all the seeds when it is known. It's greater than all the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and plod, lodge on its branches. In the same way, Lord, we pray that you will make us useful, that, that you would grow a miracle in us. For we pray now in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to uh, continue to sing, and we're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision. And you can just remain seated as we sing now.
Amen. Today is graduation Sunday, and so we're proud of our graduates, and we pray for our graduates, and uh, we, have, we have two videos. First of all, a video just generally uh, concerning graduation Sunday, in which uh, we are reminded to pray for our graduates, for their vision, and, and for their future. We just say, be thou my vision. And then a second video, which is specifically about our graduates. So let's watch those videos now. God, we're standing on this mountaintop. It has been a long climb. Behind us are the things we thought were so important. Twelve years of first days of school. Summer vacations. School dances and homecomings. Lunchroom food and locker rooms. Recesses and study halls. Grade after grade of report cards and parent-teacher conferences. Teachers and tutors and coaches. Science fairs and assemblies. Those 12 years behind us, down there at the bottom of this mountain. Now, Lord, we have climbed to the top. And we wait in the dark to see what happens next. There on the horizon, we know the moment. The light pierces the darkness. The glow, the rays of light and warmth. Radiating, illuminating, that is our future. We have climbed this high to see it. All those things we learned are the threads we have used to build these wings. We are not stepping off into an abyss, God. This is flight. This is soaring. We have come this far to launch. To ascend. To aspire. Now we hope in you, Lord. Don't let us grow tired. Renew our strength through you, and we'll soar on wings like eagles. We are prepared to fly into our future.
Now, parents and grandparents, grab a tissue, dab your eyes. <laughs> We're so proud of our graduates and so proud of you also, for all of you actually, who have guided our young people, especially as they enter more into adulthood. Let's have a word of prayer together. Dear God, bless the lives of these graduates with goodness and love and use their gifts wisely as they pursue their dreams. May they do so boldly and guide them into their future with faith, hope, and great love. Amen. Have you heard the story of the pin and the hen and the pig? I said that backwards. The hen and the hen and the pig. You see, the hen and the pig were good friends, and they went into town one day, and there was a parade happening and a, a carnival going on, and they a, a lot of festivities, and they wondered what's going on. So they asked somebody, and they found out that that community was raising funds to help those who are uh, less fortunate in their community. And the, the hen especially thought, well, that's a great idea, and said to his friend, the pig, so I've got an idea of something that we can do together to help raise funds also. We can do a breakfast for the community. And the, the pig said, I don't understand what you mean to do a breakfast. Well, the hen said, you know, I'll provide the eggs and you provide the ham. <laughs> you see, there are some people who are contributors to a good thing, <laughs> and there are others who are real givers. And for sure, there are two kinds of people in our society, those who, uh, who give, uh, those who take out also. There are givers and there are takers. So the question is, uh, which are you? And which are we as a church? Are we givers or are we takers? You know, there are many great things that we could say, of course, about Jesus. Uh, Jesus was um, a brilliant teacher. He was a prophetic change agent. Of course, he, was our, he is our savior of the world. But it says in Luke 10, in the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good. And our scripture lesson this morning is from Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to raise that to your attention too. Uh, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. No, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, and that we should walk in them. You see, it's not about us, uh, it's about God. And I think that verse, those verses especially, John Wesley paid attention to because our forefather and the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, established three simple rules that we are talking about now, three simple rules for uh, his disciples that kind of encompass all of what the New Testament especially is, is saying to us. And those three rules are do no harm, we talked about last week, do good, we're talking about that this morning, and then in two weeks we're going to talk about love God, or in the book of discipline it actually says attend to all the ordinances of God. And I say in two weeks because next Sunday is, uh, is Father's Day and uh, we have a, a special uh, guest preacher uh, next Sunday. Um, Reverend Lindsay is going, Douglas Lindsay, and for those of you who may not recognize that, that name, that's Reverend Debbie Hudgens Lindsay her husband, and he's going to be here, and he'll be preaching uh, for us next Sunday. So it'll be the Sunday after that that we'll do the third of the three simple rules to uh, love God. But we're talking today about number two, do good. And, and I remind you again of the verses that I read from Ephesians that say, uh, by grace you have been saved. Again, it, it's not about us. It's nothing that we can do but what God can do through us. And, 
As a result, we love others. That's really what it's all about. It's about love. And I want you to remember what we're, we've been saying. We reminded you last week that in uh, the New Testament that Jesus gives us the greatest commandments. That is the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And what is the second thing? Love your neighbor as yourself. And so we do that in our living. We do that by walking by faith. And it says again that Jesus went about doing good. And so if we are following Jesus, how do we do that? How do we do good? And that's what I want to address to you this morning and suggest some ways perhaps that we can do good together. And so I would say, for goodness sake, number one, develop your conscience. For goodness sake, develop your conscience. The Bible calls uh, the conscience a law written on the heart. And it's an inward principle that determines the character of our actions. And the conscience is it's our guiding light. It's a moral compass, an eternal road, a road map designed to lead us through the twists and turns of our everyday life. You see, just as there is a law of gravity, there's also, I would call it, a law of goodness, things that we just intuitively know according to our conscience. Tell the truth, do not kill, do not steal, honor your parents, and we find those, of course, in uh, the Ten Commandments. And you know, there's kind of been an argument in, in recent years about the Ten Commandments, whether or not those principles should be posted in, in public places. And I would say, rather than arguing about it or paying so much attention about whether the Ten Commandments can be posted in public pla- places, I would say to make sure that you inscribe them in your own hearts. Not to worry about so much about publicly how the Ten Commandments are being displayed, but to live them out, live them out, to inscribe those Ten Commandments in your own hearts. And what's great about the Ten Commandments related to Jesus saying what is the greatest commandment is that the Ten Commandments are broken down in those two ways. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Those are the first four commandments, and that way we know we have a relationship with God on a vertical level. But then the rest of the commandments is talking about our relationship with one another and, and on a horizontal lover, level, to love your neighbor. I want you to remember this, that our conscience is kind of like your computer. What do we say about computers? Garbage in and garbage out, right? So whatever you put into that computer is what's going to come out. For example, if I were holding a a glass of water and you accidentally came by and bumped my arm, what would happen? Water would come out of the glass, right? So then we ask the question, why does water come out of that glass? And your initial answer would probably be, well, because you got bumped. And you know what? In our lives, we get bumped in different ways. And sometimes maybe we're not very happy about what comes out. But you see, it's what we put in, what comes out. And the real answer is why water came out of that glass is because water was in it. <laughs> That's what came out of that, that cup when I got bumped because water was in it to start with. And so the point is to put godly characteristics into your life. So that's what will come out eventually. Not too long ago, we were talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, that's what we need to put into our lives so that those godly characteristics will come back out. So uh, for goodness sake, develop your conscience. And secondly, for goodness sake, cultivate your compassion. And again, Jesus went about doing good, and Jesus extended compassion to all he met. When the crowd was hungry, what happened? He fed the crowds, right? He had compassion upon them. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus with questions and who was, he was searching for a, a deeper, more meaningful uh, way of life, and he had compassion upon him and he loved him. Uh, Jesus had the power to touch, to feel, to understand the needs of those who came by. Remember in the Gospel of Luke, there was... Uh, It tells about as Jesus was going to, uh, he heard about a young boy who was dying, and he was going to be with him. 
And on the way, the, as the crowds were pressing around Jesus, so many crowds, how could he even know one individual who was pressing around him? But what happened? There was a woman who touched the hem of his garment. And Jesus stopped and said to the disciples, who did that? Who touched the hem of my garment? Jesus knew, and Jesus said to him, peace to you. And he sent her on his way. You see, Jesus had compassion in ways that uh, we may not really totally understand, but he had compassion. And my question for you is, are, are we aware? Are we tuned in also to that kind of compassion? Are, are we developing the compassion and realizing the people that might be in need in, in our situation? And maybe not to do a breakfast like the hen and the pig, but how do we reach out? How do we make a difference? And the third area I want to talk about is, uh, for goodness sake, alert your concern. Alert your concern. What is it that gets under your skin? Is there something that keeps you uh, awake at night because you know it, it's wrong? And perhaps there's something that you can do about it. Perhaps there's something that we can do about it. I'll tell you that as a pastor, I, I understand the, um, for me to be able to stand up each Sunday to be able to preach and to share with you, I understand how important that is. And I look out, and especially on graduation Sunday, I think about it. Because I know when I, when I lead worship on Sundays that there are future physicians and teachers and uh, lawyers, mothers, other leaders, scientists, and for sure there are servants. And I have the privilege of being able to break open uh, the bread of life, God's word. And I take that very seriously. And you know what? Also, as I gaze upon the, the congregation and see people that I'm still getting to know, but I can see that there are wonderful things that you can do, that we can do, as a church, and I lay awake at night and sometimes I think, you know, there's not a single thing that we can't do as a church to uh, solve the situations and the problems even of our community. And the, what I want to say is, don't just sit there. What are you going to do? What are we going to do? And there's a, a plaque at, in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., that says, thou shalt not be a victim. Thou shalt not be a perpetrator. Above all, thou shalt not be a bystander. So let's not be a bystander. Alert your concern. For goodness sake, alert your concern and be aware of ways that we can make a difference because we're concerned. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Do we care anymore? Do we have concern? Maybe some of you saw the movie uh, Aaron Brockovich, which starred Julie Roberts. It was a movie, a dramatization about a true story about a, a dizzy, unemployed, uh, single mother who became a reluctant legal assistant in a law firm because she just needed the money. She had to pay a debt. And no one took her very seriously because she kind of wore trashy clothes and maybe didn't make the best decisions in, in life. But she was passionate about what she put her heart and her mind to. And she brought a small town to its feet in California and a power company to its knees when she decided passionately to pursue the polluting of the city's water supply. And she knew she was determined to make a difference. So the question is, do you have passion anymore? Do we have passion? Uh, do we care about our world? Do we care about our community? And speaking in our community, you, you saw in the opportunities that we've got a couple things coming up where we can participate in the community in the 4th of July parade. That might sound simple, but we can be out on the lawn uh, welcoming others who are uh, in our, our neighborhood and to love them. We've got the street art fair uh, coming up, which literally surrounds us. And do we want to be a part of that kind of growth? You know, Wyandotte as a city has, 
had difficult times as we all have during the pandemic, but um, is a wonderful community and a growing community. Will we be a part of that? Will we be a growing church in the midst of that uh, growing community? Going out is a good thing for us to do. I mean, we want people to come in and to join us like for our worship time, but getting outside uh, the walls of this church and having relationships with others, that's what really makes the difference. And concerning our relationship, you see, it's our relationship with God that really matters is because that's why God uh, opened up our possibility to, to know Jesus and to love Jesus, like this video helps you to understand. We don't have that video? Okay. All right. Well, that's good because we're running out of time. <laughs> um, but the video really stressed that it's, it's all about our relationship with God that God created us and gave us Jesus to have a relationship because we were separated from God, right, until Jesus came and made sure that we could be one with God as well. So for goodness sake, alert your concern. And finally, for goodness sake, know your calling. I came across a poem recently, and I really like this poem. It goes like this. I expect to pass through this life but once. If therefore there can be any kindness I can show or any good thing I can do by, to any fellow being, let me do it now and not defer it or neglect it as I shall not pass this way again. That's written by William Penn. Let me do it now. Let me uh, understand, God, what is your calling for me now? And, you know, we don't have a calling because we think it's something really cool or neat that we can do. Uh, we have a calling because God whispers to us, uh, perhaps at night, and will not let go of what God has called you to do. And God is calling you in an urgent way uh, what is most important. And God is uh, calling us um, and filling us with God's Spirit in such a way that we can make a difference. You know, what is important also is our, um, our employment, what we become with what we do with our lives, but also with God's calling. It is God who calls us and God who gives us gifts and who helps us to understand the influence that we have. It's like God has fit us to be a piece of the puzzle. Do you understand that? There, it's like there's a empty, emptiness in the world where God has called us and given us unique gifts to be able to fill that place. And so we're like a piece of the puzzle fitting into the world. And you know what? If we don't fit into that place, God has given us gifts to do so. And if we don't do it, who will, right? And so we need to understand our calling. You know, I'm, in another month or so, I'm going to be turning 63. So I think about my life and God's calling in my life. And I would say I've had plans for my life, many plans over and over. On the one hand, plans that we have for our lives don't necessarily come out as the way we planned it. I mean, there are things that I would have liked to have been able to do. I wish I could have played for the Tigers or the Lions or maybe even be a chaplain <laughs> for the Tigers or for the Lions. And, you know, there's a, a show on TV called America Ninja Warrior. Anybody ever watch that? I love that, and I wish I had that kind of uh, youthful exuberance and uh, to be able to do those kind of things again. But I'm almost 63, and I know that has gone uh, beyond me. I just don't have the, the physical ability or the energy like those teens and 20s and 30s that uh, we see on TV. On the other hand, my life has unfolded in so many wonderful, amazing, amazing ways. Do you know that uh, country western song that says, thank God for unanswered prayer? I thank God for unanswered prayer because if it was up to me and my own limited thinking, my own limited vision, I would not have been able to uh, do anything that God has prepared me to be able to do. And so we climb every mountain and we do our best, even in the presence of pain, 
even when it seems difficult and we can't get it done, we look to God because God has given us a calling. And we understand, especially on this day, graduation day, and we think about our graduates who are moving forward, but what about us? How has God called us? And, you know, as COVID is coming to a close, we've been talking about having a new norm. What will our new norm be in, in the church and in our society? What is it that we will do that maybe is a little bit different and but, but is what God is calling us to do. And so I like that we use a prefix RE before uh, words that during this time like renewal, re-energize, refuel, and rebuild. So we're asking the question, how are you calling us, dear God? How are you renewing us uh, during this time? You know, I shared with you last week that there are words that we attribute to John Wesley that John Wesley actually didn't write. I mean, they reflect his teachings, they re reflect John Wesley's theology, and after we sing uh, our closing hymn, we're actually going to say these words together. Well, I want to remind you what those words are. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Even though those aren't directly written by John Wesley, they all reflect his uh, theology and what we need to remember and to understand as well. Dear God, we thank you that you've called us to do good, just as Jesus went about doing good. How is it, according to our salvation, uh, that you have prepared us to do good? How is it that we will make a difference in our community? How is it that together as a church we will make a difference in our community and we will love our neighbor, which is a part of the greatest commandment. We love you, God, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, but we also love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to understand how you have called us to fit into uh, the puzzle of life to make that happen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing another song, and then we're going to, like I said, we're going to dismiss by saying those words together. Please stand if you're able, and let's sing our closing song.
Amen. We focused on some of the older, more traditional songs this morning. I hope some of you who enjoy that uh, have appreciated that uh, this morning. You know, there's an old saying that we like to say, seeing is believing. And that's true, isn't it? I mean, what if I told you that in Paris there is this great structure called the Eiffel Tower? Would you believe that just because I said so? Well, you've probably seen pictures of the Eiffel Tower and maybe people who have done selfies in front of the Eiffel Tower. So we know it's there. We understand that. What if I told you God is good? Amen. Thank you. I was hoping you might respond that way. We say God is good all the time and all the time. Do you believe that just because I said so? But we've experienced it, right? We've had those kinds of experiences in our lives, and we know God's goodness for ourselves. And the Bible, of course, says, every good and perfect gift from above is coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And so we give God thanks uh, for calling us to go and do good. And for John Wesley reminding us that's one of the three simple rules, to do good. And so we want to say these words together, which uh, I think they're awesome words that reflect John Wesley's ministry, who is teaching us, of course, about Jesus' ministry. So let's say these words together. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. So thank you, dear God, for trusting us, for trusting us with your calling in our lives. And, and we go out now uh, in, the, in the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God the Father and in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for surrounding us and for equipping us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go forth and, and do good, because that's what the Bible teaches.